I am Dr. Pulpati Rana, Consultant Respiratory Physician, District General Hospital, Trincomalee. My co-chair is Dr. Vatsala Gunasinghe, Consultant Respiratory Physician at National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Valisara. And I warmly welcome you all to the webinar on sleep-related breathing disorders organized by the Sleep Assembly of the Sri Lanka College of Pulmonologists. We are delighted to have six speakers today who are very familiar with the management of sleep-related breathing disorders and the staffs. So we will be conducting the session in one stretch. Therefore, if you have any questions, you can send through the common platform of Zoom chat function. Therefore, those will be addressed at the end. So without any delay, my co-chairperson will introduce the first speaker. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Samanwali Dadu, uh, consultant respiratory physician, T.H. Karapitiya. Uh, she has uh, been uh, trained at uh, National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases as a senior registrar and had uh, further uh, training at uh, uh, Royal Brompton uh, and Harefield NHS uh, Foundation Trust. Uh, so she will be uh, delivering the first lecture of this uh, symposium. Uh, over to you, Samanwali. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Vatsala. Thank you for the co college for giving me the, this opportunity to talk to you about uh, clinical workup of excessive daytime sleepiness. <coughs> Today, my uh, lecture will be on these uh, topics. What does excessive daytime sleepiness? Falling asleep easily and almost everywhere periods of sudden and uncontrollable sleep or feeling sleepy or drowsy during past month. An individual struggling with excessive daytime sleepiness may complain of one or more of the following. Episodes of inadvertently falling asleep including sleep attacks, a prolonged main sleep episode that is unrefreshing, recurrent naps in the same day, sleep inertia that is prolonged difficulty waking up with irritability. Patient may complain of fatigue, which will need to be differentiated from excessive daytime sleepiness. <coughs> Impact of excessive daytime sleepiness. Excessive daytime sleepiness is one of the greatest challenges faced by modern society. Life has changed considerably in the past century. Uh, after uh, invention of the electricity, introduction of artificial lightning, personal computers and the internet, the, to accommodate contemporary lifestyle and economic demands, the period of wakefulness has been extended at the expense of sleep time. Most healthy individuals require approximately 7 hours of sleep during the main sleep episode to be refreshed and alert during the day. Many people curtail their sleep to meet social, vocational and economic demands. As a result, many of these people struggle with excessive daytime sleepiness when they should be fully awake. This happens over a period, gradually, unintentionally, resulting in poor insight of the cause and effect. This habit exacts a high price, individually, socially and economically. Beyond affecting patients' quality of life, mood and functionality, excessive daytime sleepiness can become a public health concern when affecting critical job holders. Example, major catastrophes happen in the past. Excessive daytime sleepiness contribute to the motor vehicle accident and fatalities each year. Just a few words about past uh, <coughs> catastrophes happens. So there was a uh, story on Exxon Valdez oil spill where the sea, uh, the millions, uh, the accident happened three decades ago with the oil spill in the ocean. So after what? What was the uh, investigator conclusions? The captain <coughs> of that ship was uh, under the influence of alcohol and was, he was asleep in his bunk during the time of accident. And again, they have uh, investigator also pointed out the, the captain has made a mistake by handing over the vessel's helm to the sleep deprived third mate. So with that, uh, the catastrophe happens and uh, there was a serious uh, mistake happen when the patient feel uh, sleepy and if the patient is doing a critical job the results will, will be very serious so with that 
how are we going to evaluate the sleepy patient? Daytime sleepiness is a subjective individual perception change with the social circumstances. Health seeking behavior on excessive daytime sleepiness is different in different social backgrounds. For example, driver might realize it on set at the onset, but sedentary life person might not. So meaning that it is important to be able to accurately screen and identify excessive daytime sleepiness and provide proper treatment. Having a standard space in evaluation of these patients is very important. Who will affect with excessive daytime sleepiness? People with insufficient sleep syndrome, inefficient sleep syndrome. Some may be because of the medications, some may be because of the neurological and psychiatric causes. <coughs> Who should be screened? Excessive sleepiness may affect cardiovascular, neurological and psychiatric status of the sufferer leading to increased morbidity, even mortality in severely affected patients. Other breathing disorders such as asthma as well as gastroesophageal reflux disease can disrupt nighttime sleep and lead to daytime sleepiness. There is a debate whether following categories need screening for OSC. Obesity, central body fat distribution, age for more than 40 years, increased neck circumference, nasal obstructions, anatomical abnormalities, whether they economic, whether they, it's economically, uh, are we to do the uh, OSA screening or are we to do the sleep screening, the daytime sleepiness screening? It's still debate. So, the, uh, uh, in clinical evaluation of excessive daytime sleepiness, start with the history taking. <coughs> Good history is not going to replace any modern tools. Questions should be open ended, it's time consuming exercise. Surrounding should be calm and patient need to be relaxed. Presence of a family member will further enhance the answers. Snoring, witness apnea, excessive sweating, gas arousal, nocturia and choking or coughing while asleep are suggestive of sleep related breathing disorder. Consider the patient work schedule, shift duty. <coughs> the use of tactics while driving to stay awake such as rolling the windows down, Playing loud music, snacking, even slapping oneself are all indicative of excessive daytime sleepiness. Time in bed, sleep hygiene are important aspects. The number of questions used to identify excessive daytime sleepiness is critical because it has many associated symptoms. Involuntary naps, drowsiness in inappropriate or unsafe situations, unrefreshing prolonged main sleep episodes. Those are important questions. Drug history such as antihistamine, can cause excessive sleepiness. Those are over the counter available. The current of past use of recreational drugs, including alcohol, should be discussed. Sudden withdrawal from stimulus such as cocaine or amphetamine also cause significant sleepiness. It is important to distinguish between sleepiness and fatigue. The distinction between the two terms should be explained to the patient. Ask about the sleep paralysis, cataplexy, hypnagogic hallucination, and sleep attacks, which may be a a clue for the neurological cause. In addition, the history should include asking about the irresistible need for naps throughout the day and whether the naps are refreshing or not. Physical examination. <coughs> Start with the body mass index and neck circumference. Examine the oral cavity for the tongue size. Note the presence of narrow arc palate, tonsillar hypertrophy, retronathia, micronathia, nasal septum deviation, allergies, nasal polyps, those are risk factors for sleep related breathing disorders, which is uh, ENO, ENT consultants, OMF consultants specialty. So malampathic classification is very helpful in evaluating airway size. It has been shown that high malampathy score of co and nasal obstruction are risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea. Then once the history and examination finish, we can do the stop bank questionnaire. It has Six parts, more than four is uh, having high risk patients with OSC. It's suggestive of OSC. <coughs> what are the subjective measures of sleepiness? A first go, Stanford sleepiness scale, sleep diary. <coughs> Out of these, a first go is the common, commonly used one. It has got uh, eight situations where a patient can mark depending on how the, high, the chance how, how they feel, the uh, chance of naps, sleepiness during that occasion. 
for example watching television whether the patient has a slight chance moderate chance or high chance out of uh, this eight uh, into three if the patient has got 11 that is start with the more than 11 is significant and there is a chance of having a <coughs> sleep related breathing disorders Stanford sleepiness scale is one of them different tools have different sensitivity and specificities for example if the patient is having severe OSC uh, stop bank has a sensitivity of 95 percent but Epper score has a 79 percent sensitivity specificity wise stop bank has a 25 percent specificity but Epper score has 75 percent specificity sleep diary that is the important thing for the patient's history a patient's sleep diary can give insight into the cause of the patient's sleepiness the patient is asked to maintain this log for two weeks recording bedtime wake time number of arousal time it takes to return to sleep after an arousal <coughs> and any other relevant symptoms so it's helpful to identify the sleep fragmentation insufficient sleep time circadian rhythm sleep disorders and etc so this is the uh, sample of sleep uh, sleep diary where that uh, one first uh, one is uh, filled for a uh, example that this uh, this can use to see how good the patient sleep during the last two weeks so once the history examination different questions and uh, questionnaires and sleep diary is filled we have identified how uh, probable the patient has sleep disorders breathing <coughs> or other sleep disorders so depending on the pretest probability we will be either exclude or diagnose the patient's condition <coughs> what are the literature on excessive daytime sleepiness excessive daytime sleepiness may be under recognized a study published in 2019 conducted by Barnum and colleagues uh, on, on US adult population they have studied uh, 5,962 patients who are more than 18 years old. Uh, they examine the prevalence, social demographic features, pattern of comorbidity and impact on functional impairment of excessive sleepiness and associated symptom in nationally representative sample of adults. So participants queried about their sleep using composite international diagnostic interview. So responded were question about feeling sleepy during the day and falling asleep in permissive situations. So what is the result? So out of 5,692 people, 6% uh, have said they have got difficulty awakening only. Another 6% said they insufficient sleep. There were 9% says both. There were 21% says falling asleep on the daytime. And uh, all three were seen in 14%, 6%. Further, the study says excessive daytime plus associated symptoms are more common with female. The prevalence of excessive daytime plus associated symptoms were lower in adults with higher family income. Further, they have observed excessive daytime plus associated symptoms were less common among those who were working, students, homemakers, or retired. The prevalence of excessive daytime plus associated symptoms was not significantly different across different ethnic groups. Interesting. <coughs> survey done in US. In the 2000 Sleeve Foundation goal up, survey conducted in United States. They have found out 20% of respondents reported that daytime sleepiness interfered with their daily activities. 8% fell asleep at work and 19 made errors at work because of sleepiness. Yet 61% of the respondent reported their primary physician had never asked how well they slept. With that, we'll go to the first uh, case scenario. Uh, Mr. D, 61 year old, retired chief engineer, previously diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus and hypertension, presented with breathlessness for last one year. <clears throat> One year back, he developed shortness of breathing on mild exertion, which he didn't pay much attention. Over the year, shortness of breathing gradually increased up to MMRC grade 3. Additionally, he complained daytime sleepiness and snoring at night. No morning headache or episodes of observed apnea. 
he had daytime fatigability and experienced three episodes of knee accidents while driving on the highway following this he never drove he had nocturia which means he was waking about six times in, at night although his blood pressure was in optimal control previously fluctuations were noted within the last year need in frequent drug regime alterations so he has owing to his symptom he underwent 2d echo and was found to have moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension at that time his fp score was 20 stop bank 4 bmi 30 early morning abg revealed high bicarbonate uh, 39 mm of mercury lung function study revealed obstructive airway disease HRCT was reported as normal and started him on inhaler treatment and sleep study was performed. <coughs> It showed that uh, HI of 19.8 but overnight uh, sleep study showed severe hypoxia in the night. His uh, uh, 33 32% of his sleep is less than 89 of the saturation. This is his stress. So he was diagnosed as uh, obesity hyperventilation syndrome and COPD overlap. leading to pulmonary hypertension after started on home bipap treatment the assessment after few month was showed his breathlessness reduced up to mmrc grade 1 and he can walk 1 km without stopping only one time wake up now he is only one time wake up at night no daytime sleepiness or fatigue blood pressure is well controlled weight reduced 12 kilos <coughs> now fp scale is 2 repeat study his average hi was 4.3 and latest echo shows previously noted pulmonary hypertension is not seen anymore <coughs> the second case uh, i conclude with this 54 year old mother of three children works as a project officer in education office diagnosed with hypothyroidism on thyroxine for 2 years presented with gradually worsening daytime sleepiness for last one year duration She was a loud snorer. During last few months, it was not visibly worsening. She goes to sleep routinely at 9:30 p.m. and sleep for seven hours. She has a good sleep hygiene. She never went to deep sleep during her sleep. She was fully awake throughout her sleep. She even could recall what happened in her surrounding next day. During her sleep, she experienced frequent interruptions, six to seven attacks per night. She had choking episodes once or twice per month. Vivid dreams are very common. As a result, she awakes with a headache. She doesn't have sleep latency. Feeling tired whole day, unable to concentrate. Preferred to be on the bed whole day, but gets angry with herself as she was not having any way to relieve her suffering. She was gradually trying to miss her routine work. Neither enjoyed her work. So others have noticed that she was lethargic and irritable. We kept once for urination. Some memory loss was obvious. She accepted that she has gained more than 10 kilograms over the last one year. <coughs> History taken from husband. He also accepted that uh, he is disrupted by the wife's loud snoring. Same time, the all the family is suffering with the illness. So examination findings: uh, BMI of 30, myelin protein score 4, EPR score is 15. Neck circumference 37, stop bank 2, uh, ECG full T inversions were there, echo was normal, mild inferior basal hypokinesia. <coughs> This is a sleep study. So HI was 53.5, of ODI uh, 57.6. With that, uh, this is a trace. So I I. <laughs> ಅತ್ಯವಶ್ಯ <laughs> ಹಾಲಕ್ಕೆ <laughs> 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 
So with that, uh, she had uh, treated with sleep uh, CPAP machine and she responded very well and she perceived that now she is back to her base, baseline. So I will conclude my uh, lecture. In the modern world, excessive daytime sleepiness is a significant burden to the person, family and society. Early identification and treatment is critical for healthy living. Evaluation with good history and arranging a diagnosis workup will direct towards the optimum treatment. Need awareness among medical personnel, policy makers and researchers. Establishing a screening pathway in high risk group and critical job holder might be the future of this endeavor. So, Special thanks I would like to give to all the staff in Respiratory Clinic Gaul for helping and conducting the sleep clinic even with the COVID uh, era. Thank you everybody. Thank you very much Dr. Saman Mali for your nice presentation. I want to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Dilesa Vadasinghe who is a consultant respiratory physician and a lecturer in physiology at Faculty of Medicine, University of Kalania. Dilesha trained in respiratory medicine at National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases, Valisara, followed by overseas training in Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Foundation Trust, where she exposed to sleep medicine and also domiciliary NIV, followed by further training there with transplant medicine and also host defenses at Oxford University. Over to you, Dilesha. Thank you very much, Dr. Poole, for that very kind words of introduction. And I'd like to thank the college and the Sleep Assembly for giving me this opportunity today to speak. So this is not a very comprehensive lecture or talk on the full range of diagnostic workup, but this is just a stimulant to stimulate you to uh, have an interest about this diagnostic workup of sleep-related breathing disorders and to read more. Right? Okay, so I would, um, I will introduce you to the investigations of sleep for sleep apnea and I will highlight some uh, normal aspects of sleep which you can't forget to interpret abnormalities in sleep and then I will talk you through how to interpret a sleep study briefly. So this is to recap what, what the previous speaker have said and we know that now sleep apnea causes sleep fragmentation leading to excessive daytime sleepiness and also the hypoxia and the hypercapnia would trigger stress hormone release and lead to various cardiovascular complications and both of them would lead to increased morbidity and mortality uh, in these patients. So uh, this very briefly, according to the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, the sleep-related breathing di disorders are classified into four main groups. What are they? The central sleep apnea syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome disorders, and the sleep-related hypoventilation disorders, and the hypo sleep-related hypoxemia disorders. So as uh, Dr. Saman Mali said very correctly, um, a comprehensive sleep history and physical examination uh, is the cornerstone of the initial evaluation of any patient with uh, sleep symptoms of sleep-related breathing disorders. But uh, keep in mind that a clinical history and examination alone is not sufficient to diagnose uh, sleep-related breathing disorders. So we need to do further investigations. And the invest what are the investigations? You can do them for the diagnosis of the disease and also to assess for the risk, the, the assess the risk and evaluate other comorbidities. So what are the sleep uh, uh, investigations for diagnosis of sleep uh, sleep uh, sleep related breathing disorders? Are the sleep studies? They're usually of basically two types, the attendant polysomnography, which is done in a sleep laboratory, mainly in the hospital set up in Sri Lanka, and then the unattended diagnostic sleep studies, which are basically we call them as the home sleep studies. Right? And then a daytime blood gas, arterial blood gas is very important in these patients, especially in the patients who are quite obese. And nowadays we see we can do transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring, which is um, 
it's fairly new uh, investigation in Sri Lanka and it's available only in very few centers over the country such as I think Candy was the first place to buy the monitor and then Hamban Tata and as well as the sleep laboratory which I which is a very the small small sleep laboratory which I have just started at the faculty also we have the facility to perform transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring tests. So uh, what is a sleep study? So a sleep study, or we call it a polysomnography, is a comprehensive test which we can use to diagnose sleep disorders. This would record your brain waves, those are the EEG signals, your oxygen level in your blood, your heart rate and your breathing. As well as in the full polysomnography you can monitor your leg movements and eye movements as well. So once these data are recorded or collected, these signals need to be processed in order to be viewed. So on to your left, you can see uh, a sleep study recording system, which was a very, which is a very old one, and it's an analog device. So in order to view, you need to take printouts of many many roll reams of paper to analyze but now on the towards the left you can see, uh, towards the right of you you can see the uh, current digital recording systems which are digital and it is easy to adjust and uh, to um, adjust not adjust uh, to uh, for you to optimize and for you to read and view the uh, parameters measured during the sleep studies so basically there are four types of uh, or four levels of sleep studies which we can perform out of which the type one or the level one sleep study is the attended laboratory based polysomnography and it would measure a minimum of seven channels uh, including EEG, EOG, the chin EM, EMG, ECG, heart rate, airflow, your respiratory effort and your oxygen saturation. Also snoring is included in this. And then the uh, level 2 study or the type 2 study is, measures all seven but it does not have a attended sleep physician in the laboratory at that time. So you can do it as a home sleep study or maybe in um, um, uh, board where there is no sleep technician as well. Then the modifiable or the level three uh, level three sleep study. We all know that apnea link is one of the home sleep st study devices which is widely used in Sri Lanka in many respiratory centers, and it is a level three sleep study where you measure about a minimum of four channels uh, during the sleep, and then. If there, there is another level of sleep study, which is the level four, where you measure, measure either one or two, usually the overnight pulse oximetry is a level four study, which uh, we can use our transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitor to do uh, to to do a level four study actually. Right. So as I said before, the attended polysomnography, which is the uh, we would say gold, we can say the gold standard or the uh, the most appropriate study to diagnose sleep-related breathing disorders. So would measure these seven um, uh, parameters: the EEG, electroculogram, chin and leg electromyography, uh, airflow, your oxygen, arterial oxygen saturation, respiratory effort, ECG, and the heart rate, in, with, together with snoring. And then these three parameters, the EEG signals, EMG signals and your EOG signals are very important in identifying what sleep stage you are in, whether you fall asleep easily, whether you do not fall asleep, when do you get your REM sleep and all, all of those can be monitored using this, uh, these three um, parameters. And I would not try to... Uh, uh, pronounce the second word, uh, the, the surname of this uh, well-known researcher, but Dr. Allen in 1968 uh, has uh, developed the first standard scoring system uh, for human sleep stages together with uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Kales. And this was used for many decades until the American Association of Sleep Medicine took over and start, uh, build, uh, brought forward their manual for sleep scoring in 2007. So currently we use the AASM scoring uh, rules 
for sleep scoring, which is the 2.6 version, which is unfortunately not freely available online unless you are a member of it or you purchase it, you, you, you have no access to this sleep scoring manual. So I will not go in detail to all sleep stages, but know that there are th four sleep stages, the N1, N2, N3, which are the non-REM sleep and the REM sleep, and W is the wakefulness. The, the, each um, of the, these uh, sleep uh, stages have their own characteristics, EEG characteristics, which would give you uh, a uh, chance of identifying them separately and which a sleep uh, sleep technician or the sleep physiologist is uh, will do the sleep scoring for you right then the respiratory parameters as respiratory physicians the respiratory events are of more interest to us and we use these um, signals to classify or identify the different respiratory uh, disorders during sleep so we use the airflow, respiratory effort, oxygen uh, saturation, and the snoring sound. So basically, there are two major types of respiratory events, which are the apneas and the hypopnea. Apnea, as the word explains, self-explains, is cessation of breathing, and hypopnea is a redu reduction in the uh, breathing flow. So apnea is defined as cessation of airflow for a minimum of 10 seconds during sleep and based on the respiratory effort the, the patient or the subject would have, it's further divided into three types which are the obstructive, central or mixed type of apneas. But hypopneas from the ASM recent uh, developments or the guidelines, they classify it as just obstructive events only. So this slide would show you the type, uh, different types of apneas. Here in central sleep ap apnea, uh, the cessation of respiratory drive uh, results in lack of respiratory movement. So there is no respiratory movement as well. There is no airflow. You will see a desaturation in them. In obstructive apneas, what happens is no airflow or 90% reduction in the airflow uh, when measured with continuous respiratory efforts, right? So that is the difference in obstructive and central. And in mixed, what happens is you see both parts. So there is no flow. And initially, there will be no effort. But then towards the latter part, you would see some effort. So this is another slide which shows the uh, mixed apneas. So ideally, or uh, usually, they would we would look for at least uh, three or more uh, obstructed inspiratory efforts during the latter part of a mixed apnea. Right. So the uh, rules for the this this just this slides just summarizes the rules for um, the, the, the rules for scoring a hypopnea. So your, the peak signal of your flow should drop by more, at least or more than thirty percent. And the duration of the drop should be at least for 10 seconds. And there should be a desaturation of um, equals to or more than 3% or the event should be associated with an arousal. So this is the latest hypopnea classification. So this, uh, in, another, in other terms, you would say that a hypopnea is an event when you uh, when uh, uh, the, it's an event which detects it's detected when a 10 second cessation or a reduction in signal drop uh, which we have we see about 70 percent drop in your um, respiratory uh, flow signals Okay, and then there's another term, the upper airway resistance, which we talk a lot about. In here, you would see, as you can see here, I'm sorry that this is a very um, small print and it's not very visible at the back, but then you would see a flattening of the pressure uh, flow with associated with snoring, and this is called the upper airway resistance. And then there is another uh, kind of um, uh, respiratory uh, uh, breathing pattern which we call the chine stocks respirations and here what happens is you would see a crescendo decrescendo pattern of air flow and the ASM has laid down another set of rules to diagnose 
child stalks respiration uh, as well i will not go into detail uh, about it but then you can see that there is a crescendo decrescendo uh, air flow pattern in child stalks respiration so this it would be much clearly visible you can see a very nice crescendo decrescendo pattern okay now so now we know we know that there are many types of sleep studies and i have introduced you to some of the very common terms we use when we are uh, reading a sleep study so i told you there are two types of sleep studies the uh, attended polysomnography or the home sleep apnea tests so what do we offer to our patient so usually all patients with signs and symptoms what dr saman mali told about uh, indicating that they have increased risk of sleep apnea should undergo a sleep study and to decide whether it's a home sleep study what what kind of sleep study we should uh, look at other comorbidities so if your patient has a significant cardiopulmonary disease a potential respiratory muscle weakness or neuromuscular disorder they have hyperventilation while they are awake or are at risk of uh, uh, sleep related hypoventilation they have stroke opioid use in severe insomnia and symptoms of other respiratory uh, not respiratory sleep disorders such as the limb movement disorders and the environment for a sleep study home sleep study is not appropriate such patients should be undergo a laboratory sleep study other all others can undergo a home sleep study as their initial investigation because it's less um, expensive as well as easy to be done because usually we can do it at their homes now when we are talking about interpreting a sleep report usually most of us were used were are used to look at the ahi classify whether they have a sleep apnea or not and tell whether it's moderate mild moderate or severe and then that's it but that is not what we should be doing as respiratory uh, physicians when you get a sleep report so first you will have to see whether you the patient has had a uh, adequate length of a study so for a home sleep study ideally it should be at least 4 hours of recordings and for a um, uh, laboratory polysomnography they have not Uh, specify the time but then at least 2 hours of good quality sleep is what the uh, some of the asm documents mention right and then you will have to also do not before looking at the numbers go look at the graphical representation there is a hypnogram and uh, all all the graphical representation of various uh, sleep uh, related breathing disorders so look at it as well and then look at your ahi also just not the number see what is at with during various body positions which your machine would record what is the supine ahi what is the uh, non supine ohi then you can identify the appropriate treatment for your patient as well and then the oxygen values the oxygen parameters are very important so usually if the patient's saturation is less than 89% the patient would need uh, oxygen at night but it is not universal for everybody you can try cpap if the cpap doesn't correct it only you can think about whether you need to add a bit of supplemental oxygen at night and then the ecg recordings because with this hypoxia it can trigger arrhythmias during sleep so look at your ecg recordings as well and also then the various limb movement recordings when you uh, are using your sleep uh, report so the graphic summary you will see something like this with various other panels what some of the reports what reports what dr saman mali showed as well so this is a uh, full night uh, poly full polysomnography where you see the hypnogram as well sleep stages are recorded so in order to interpret a sleep study you should know that this in green the rem sleep studies a uh, rem sleep uh, periods you should see at have at least about 3 to 5 rem uh, sleep periods during a good sleep right and uh, 
then the, there are various other things you can identify from the hypnogram which I will show in my next slide and the desaturation levels you can get an idea about it and the body position whether the patient was on the right side whether they were on the left side whether they were supine and all the details are in your sleep report so this hypnogram shows so from the time you are awake when you go to uh, stage n1 that's when you're start to sleep so that is called the sleep onset and then that period is called the sleep latency and REM latency is REM onset is when you start to have your REM sleep and that part from the sleep onset to the time when you have REM we call it REM latency and then there should be at least three to five REM, uh, REM sleep periods during a uh, sleep study. And these are just for reference. The sleep efficiency, which you'd see in numbers in your uh, report, should be more than 85 to be normal. When you're aging, it would go down and about 80% sleep efficiency is normal for an elderly person. Okay, so these are just numbers to remember. You don't want to remember, actually, you can just keep it with you and uh, assess your sleep report uh, so that you would know whether there is sleep fragmentation or whether the sleep architecture is altered uh, using these numbers as well. So this is how your sleep report would sh see, show in numbers. Various sleep studies, various machines would give different reports. Uh, so the total recording time is seen, sleep period, the total uh, sleep time, sleep efficiency is given, which is 87% in this patient, it's normal. And then the sleep latency and uh, the, whether there are how many awakenings, how many REM periods, what is the REM latency. So there's a lot of information in your sleep report. Okay, so the very uh, the interesting part the apnea hypopnea index so it is the number of all obs uh, obstructive central mixed apneas and hypopneas you have during your sleep time per hour uh, is called your AHI or the apnea hypopnea index if it is 0 to 5 we tell it is normal and that they don't have sleep apnea 5 to 15 it's mild sleep apnea 15 to 30 we classify it as moderate sleep apnea and more than 30 is severe sleep apnea so uh, remember as I told look at the body position see whether your patient needs CPAP or can positional therapy uh, uh, improve his symptoms alone right so this is uh, uh, because we are running out of time actually so that my, the, we will just briefly look at a sleep report I'm sorry that I didn't uh, have the gra graphic representation of this sleep report the patient slept adequately now we we'll start with AHI AHI is 8.8 .8 per hour and this is mild sleep apnea and you can see that uh, the most most of these events are uh, hypop during uh, are hypopnic events and only a little bit is apneic events. So in this patient with mild sleep apnea, because it's more hypopneas, not apneas, so it is not severe as having more apneas than hypopneas. So your sleep study can tell, uh, tell uh, give you a rough idea about how uh, early this patient should be on your on a CPAP machine or inter intervention needs to be done. So when you look at the minimum oxygen level, the saturation is 82%. So he has significant desaturation at night despite not a low uh, AHI. And then also when you look at the body position, you can see that during supine, his AHI is 18.3 while when he is non-supine it's 4.9 so 4.9 is normal and 18.3 is uh, moderate in this patient when he is uh, supine so positional therapy is also uh, something what this patient can try so in summary this patient would have mild sleep apnea which is mainly uh, during the supine position okay so finally a very few words about obesity hypoventilation syndrome we know that it's defined as bmi more than 30 there should be daytime hypercapnia they can be have various types of sleep disordered breathing uh, associated with the uh, obesity hyperventilation but make sure that you rule out all other causes uh, of hypoventilation before you label this as obesity hypoventilation syndrome right 
So there are about studies have shown that 70 to 80 per, 90 percent of patients with OH obesity hyperventilation has or, or sleep apnea, and about 50, 10 to 15 percent with sleep apnea referred to the sleep laboratory uh, do have diurnal hypercapnia. So do a blood gas in your patient if you suspect obesity hypoventilation. Right. So in summary, uh, sleep studies are key in diagnosing sleep-related breathing disorders. Do not only rely on the AHI alone when you are interpreting a sleep study. And the level one uh, polysomnography is the standard test, but home sleep apnea tests are also helpful in diagnosing sleep apnea at the appropriate settings. Okay, right. Thank you. I hope that I was able to um, stimulate the interest in going home and reading more about sleep studies. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dilesha, for that uh, excellent lecture. But, uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Damit Rodrigo, uh, consultant respiratory physician, uh, DGH Hambantota. Uh, he was trained in respiratory medicine at uh, NHRD Valisara. And also he trained on sleep and uh, domiciliary NIV at uh, Royal Brompton and Harefield NHS Trust. Over to you, Damit. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Watsala, for that introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to deliver this lecture in this uh, distinguished forum. Uh, so, uh, right. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, my topic is to uh, discuss on the management of sleep-related breathing disorders. So far, we had two uh, very interesting lectures on uh, sleep OSA symptomatology and uh, uh, diagnostics by Dr. Uh, Dilesha and Dr. Saman Mali. Uh, so we'll move on to my lecture now. So I thought of uh, getting a case-based approach in this lecture. So uh, my talk will be based on three case scenarios that I'm going to present to you now. Uh, so this first case is a 52-year-old man uh, in the IT industry uh, with a BMI of 32, has gastroesophageal reflux and uh, premature right knee osteoarthritis. Presents to you because his Apple Watch says that he stops breathing 20 times and are during his sleep. So he's uh, into this IT business, a bit of a high tech guy using this Apple Watch. And the Apple Watch now says that his breathing stops 20 times during his sleep. Uh, his wife says he occasionally snores during his sleep, but he reports a good quality sleep uh, without any daytime somnolence. So he's, uh, he's asymptomatic in that case. Uh, he has a family history of premature coronary artery disease in his father, and therefore uh, the patient is worried. Uh, move on to the second case, a 42-year-old male banker with type 2 diabetes, hypertension, has a BMI of 28, presents to you uh, because uh, with uh, symptoms of loud snoring, excessive daytime somnolence. Uh, his wife has noticed that his breathing literally stops at some occasions during his sleep and he wakes up gasping on air uh, for a uh, few occasions. So it's a case of full-blown symptoms of OSA. Uh, he has recently re-ended a car driving home from work as well. Third case, a 55-year-old woman, a housewife, with a BMI of 32, with refractory hypertension. Uh, that is, her blood pressure was controlled on uh, five antihypertensive medication. Uh, had a recent primary coronary intervention to her right coronary artery after a positive exercise CCG. Referred from your cardiologist uh, with the positive with the sleep study report, which uh, indicates an HI of 13 power. So, uh, cardiologist has. Uh, uh, gone ahead with the uh, sleep study because he has felt that uh, there's a risk for OSC. Uh, again, this lady also has good quality sleep without any daytime somnolence, so she is also asymptomatic. So we have three cases. I have presented you three cases. So which case you would uh, choose to investigate further or you would rather choose to treatment, uh, go for treatment is the uh, key question now. All right. With that, we'll uh, move on to uh, my talk. Uh, so this is not the classic ICD-10 classification or uh, something like that. I mean, uh, in sleep-related, in, in sleep disorders. Today, uh, we are basically dealing with sleep-related breathing disorders. Under which umbrella, you get the obstructive sleep apneas, the central sleep apnea, nocturnal hypoventilations, and overlap uh, syndromes. So I'll be basically touching uh, on the obstructive sleep apnea and nocturnal hypoventilation management. Right, so objectives of my talk, uh, 
First would be to discuss the management options for sleep-related breathing disorders. Uh, then to select uh, the right or the correct patient for management or treatment. In other words, uh, who should get treated in sleep apnea. Discuss the different modes of uh, positive airway pressure treatment or PAP treatment. Um, that is a uh, fixed pressure CPAP, auto titrating CPAP or APAP and the BPAP or the bi-level positive airway pressure. Identify or uh, to have a look at the novel or the, these uh, non-CPAP therapies for SA. Uh, there are some upcoming evidence and um, to have a look at the current uh, SRBD management guidelines, the different guidelines issued by different bodies, uh, namely the American Academy for Sleep Medicine, the American guideline, uh, the UK guideline jointly issued by the BTS, NICE and the RCP and the ERS. Right. So the first would be to discuss the management options. So as we all uh, aware, uh, these management options are basically divided into behavioral or lifestyle interventions, uh, the gold standard uh, positive airway pressure or PAP treatment and uh, uh, non-CPAP therapies also. Right, so the behavioral or lifestyle interventions mainly focus on weight reduction and uh, cutting down of alcohol, especially in the evenings, complete cessation of smoking and avoiding of sedatives or sleeping tablets. So it's very important that these lifestyle interventions are uh, started along with the more proven uh, effective therapies like CPAP at the same time. Uh, continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP is the treatment of choice for symptomatic moderate to severe uh, obstructive sleep apnea and it is the most effective way of treating symptomatic OSA. Uh, so what uh, CPAP uh, does is or it functions as a pneumatic splint uh, to maintain the upper airway patency by providing a pressure throughout all phases of sleep uh, during, uh, by uh, preventing uh, the airway getting collapsed. Right. So how would you select the correct patient for treatment or else who should get treated in sleep apnea? Right. So here I would like to uh, post you for options. Uh, yeah, how to select the correct patient. Uh, for you to uh, select which group you should rather go and investigate further or treat. Should we be treating all those with uh, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, who comes to us and ask for treatment? Or should we be treating uh, all those with OSA who are at a higher cardiovascular risk regardless of their symptoms? Or should we be treating all those with OSA and symptoms? This is obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Or should we be treating everyone or should we be basically screening everybody for OSA and treat and diagnose and treat? So uh, what I can tell you right now is this is what we are doing at the moment. We are investigating, we are in fact treating all those who are coming and asking, uh, who are coming uh, to ask uh, uh, for treatment. This is what we are doing at the moment, right? So uh, how about uh, screening everybody? I mean, should we be screening everyone for OSA? Uh, should we pick everyone on the street and uh, screen for OSA and do a sleep study and diagnose and treat? Is this uh, is this effective or is this cost effective? Uh, so the answer came from uh, the US or United States uh, Preventive Services Task Force statement, which was uh, released in 2017. Uh, they looked at the evidence and they found that uh, there were no studies identified evaluating the impact of screening and treating asymptomatic patients. Uh, so they concluded saying that uh, there's, uh, I mean, the evidence is insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms of uh, screening for OSA in asymptomatic adults. So uh, if you, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, there's no point, I mean, take uh, everyone and screen them and uh, diagnose the OSA and treating. Uh, it's not, the, uh, it's not uh, effective actually. So, uh, yeah. So therefore, uh, treating, I mean, or investigating uh, all with the uh, sleep uh, testing or treating everyone with OSA is in fact not the correct way. So how about uh, uh, treating all with, uh, I mean, these patients with obstructive sleep apnea with a high cardiovascular risk regardless of symptoms. So uh, CPAP and incident cardiovascular disease risk, uh, there have been a lot of research done on this area. This is one of uh, the early researches done in 2005 published in the Lancet. Uh, this, is an, uh, this, is, this was an observational study uh, where uh, these researchers, they, uh, they studied a cohort of uh, symptomatic obstructive sleep apnea patients. Mind you, these patients were symptomatic uh, or sleepy patients. Uh, they had two groups. 
uh, one group uh, was willing to go for CPAP, the other group was not willing to go for CPAP and they were given uh, usual care other than CPAP. They followed up this cohort of patients for uh, uh, nearly 14 years and uh, found, out, found out that uh, the group of patients who were not willing to go for CPAP had a three times, 2.9 times or rather three times higher risk of uh, uh, premature, uh, higher risk of fatal cardiovascular event. Uh, or not fatal or non-fatal cardiovascular events. So uh, the conclusion was that in men, uh, because this study was done only in men, uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea or hypopnea significantly increases the risk of fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events and CPAP treatment reduces the risk. Uh, so this is, uh, with that, uh, people were doing a lot of randomized control trials. So this is uh, the SAVE trial, the largest randomized control trial done to date. Uh, with uh, 2,700 patients. Uh, mind you, they were non-sleepy patients, so this is very important uh, because in randomized control trials, you can't subject uh, symptomatic patients, so they have taken non-sleepy OSA patients. And uh, the study design was uh, they, uh, uh, the study population, uh, some were assigned to CPAP, a group of patients were assigned to CPAP, and the other group was uh, given usual care other than CPAP, and they followed up this cohort of patients for 3.7 years. And uh, you can, uh, uh, for, uh, the, uh, for uh, uh, the presence of uh, cardiovascular events. So you can see the two curves nearly overlap, uh, showing that uh, CPAP or continuous positive airway pressure had uh, no, uh, no significant uh, benefit on uh, reducing cardiovascular events. So the SAVE trial was a negative study. Uh, then uh, very recently, a couple of years back, uh, this uh, famous ISAC study was also published. Again, uh, quite a similar study design. They, uh, they got actually patients who had a uh, recent acute coronary event and again, uh, uh, patients, uh, a cohort of patients with sleep, obstructive sleep apnea uh, who were again not symptomatic. Uh, this is again a randomized controlled trial and followed up these patients for nearly 72 months and again uh, found out that uh, CPAP doesn't reduce the, uh, the uh, cardiovascular events. Uh, and again, it was a, this was a negative study. So they conclude saying that among non-sleepy patients with acute coronary syndrome, the presence of OSA uh, was not associated with an increased prevalence of cardiovascular events and treatment with CPAP did not significantly reduce this prevalence. Right. Uh, so uh, the, here in this slide, I have shown uh, the uh, complete I amino mean, meta-analysis of all the randomized and non-randomized controlled trials done on this area, CPAP and cardiovascular events. Uh, when you uh, categorize them into randomized and non-randomized controlled trials, these studies, you can clearly see a difference. In randomized controlled trials, you tend to uh, see, I mean, all, almost all of them have resulted in a negative study. I mean, there was uh, CPAP uh, was not showing any significant benefit. But when you uh, focus on the non-randomized control trials or the observational studies, they, were, they have resulted positive. So why is the difference? It's quite simple. It is the uh, methodology of these studies uh, because as I've told you before, in uh, randomized control trials were basically done on patients who were non-sleepy or who were not having symptoms because you can't subject sleepy patients. You can't deprive them of, uh, uh, of CPAP and uh, therefore uh, they have not shown any benefit. But in non-randomized control trials, they have taken sleepy patients and therefore they have clearly shown benefit from CPAP. So this, in, this itself shows that it is the uh, symptomatic patients or the sleepy patients that would benefit from CPAP, right? So uh, treating all, all with OSA with the, because they have a high cardiovascular risk regardless of symptoms is again not the not should not be the way forward. So it is the the, the group that we should rather focus on is the. Uh, is a group uh, with obstructive sleep apnea and symptoms. In other words, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, right? But still, having said that, there's an exception. This is the refractory hypertension group. Uh, this study, uh, which consists of 194 patients with elevated blood pressure, uh, basically patients with resistant hypertension, that is hypertension, the blood pressure was controlled on three or four antihypertensive meds or refractory hypertension, uh, whose blood pressure was controlled on more than five antihypertensive medication with moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, uh, were uh, 
uh, I mean, again, they had two groups. Uh, one group had CPAP and the other group uh, had the usual care other than CPAP and they, were follow they followed up these patients for 12 weeks for their blood pressure. And uh, you can clearly see the refractory group, uh, uh, refractory hypertension group, they had significant reduction in their blood pressure uh, with CPAP. So uh, CPAP uh, has a benefit, ha has, uh, has a place in uh, reducing the blood pressure in the refractory hypertension group. So back to my case scenarios, the first case, this patient, this asymptomatic man uh, who, uh, who came to you because his Apple Watch says that his breathing stops in the night, uh, he had no symptoms to improve and there's no evidence that cardiovascular disease risk uh, will improve with treatment. Therefore, all what he needs is counseling on uh, evidence-based weight loss interventions. My second case, uh, the male banker with symptoms, uh, full-blown symptoms of OSA, he needs further testing for OSA and initiation of CPAP along with lifestyle interventions. The third patient, the asymptomatic obese woman uh, with refractory hypertension who recently had a PCI, she needs CPAP, she will benefit from CPAP. Though she was asymptomatic, uh, she had a, uh, I mean, uh, she had resistant hypertension and CPAP has a place in reducing her blood pressure. Right, so uh, I'll pick my second case and move forward. Uh, this 42-year-old banker uh, who had these uh, comorbidities, uh, he was uh, symptomatic with the upward sleepiness scale score of 18. Uh, wife has noticed witness apnea, he has had a road traffic accident as well. We have gone ahead with the sleep study and the apnea hypopnea index is 55 now, which showed severe obstructive sleep apnea. Right, so how would you manage him? Yes, of course, he needs initiation of CPAP after proper counseling uh, with lifestyle interventions, focusing on weight reduction. Right, so with that, we move on to my third part of my talk to discuss the different modes of PAP treatment. Right, so this is the traditional obstructive sleep apnea care delivery model. Once you uh, have a patient with possible obstructive sleep apnea, you do a in-lab sleep study, as Dilesh told, or a uh, home sleep study, of course. Uh, and then you have to do a CPAP uh, pressure titration or pressure titration to find out the ideal pressure that you should set in a fixed pressure CPAP machine to this patient. And once you find that out, you set that pressure on a fixed pressure CPAP and you initiate CPAP and then follow up this patient. So this is the traditional OSA care delivery model. Uh, so having said that, we have two uh, important modes, the CPAP mode and the APAP mode. So the, in CPAP, uh, what we do is we set a fixed pressure after finding that pressure from a pressure titration and we set the pressure uh, manually on a fixed pressure device and that is the pressure that the patient will get throughout his sleep. And then we have this APAP or the auto titrating CPAP mode where uh, these machines uh, are more sophisticated because they can sense the patient's airway resistance and uh, can deliver uh, a different pressure because you are setting a pressure range, uh, say from five centimeters to 20 centimeters of water like, and uh, the machine sensors and delivers a different pressure depending on the patient's resistance. This is what we call the APAP or autotype rating PAP. So, uh, so, uh, so once you screen and uh, diagnose, uh, then uh, let's diagnose, uh, then you have to do a pressure titration uh, that you can do uh, manually. And there's uh, two ways of doing a pressure titration, a manual titration uh, with in-lab polysomnography, a sleep technician sitting with the patient uh, while the patient uh, is sleeping and uh, according to the polysomnographic data, the, uh, the, uh, the technician manually titrates the pressure and uh, find out the pressure and then you start the patient uh, on fixed pressure CPAP. This is the traditional pathway. Or else, once you diagnose, you can straight away start the patient on uh, auto titrating PAP or APAP uh, by giving a range of pressures and the patient, uh, you can send the patient home. Uh, this is more convenient. Right, so APAP versus CPAP. So there have been a lot of researches done on this area. This is a meta-analysis uh, comparing auto titrating PAP versus uh, continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, you can uh, see that uh, APAP or auto titrating PAP mode uh, was superior because uh, it uh, increases the patient's compliance or CPAP adherence and also reduces the patient's symptoms. So the preferred approach is uh, auto titrating PAP. You can set a pressure range. Uh, usually the range that we start is five, I mean, we, we give is five to 20 centimeters of water. 
What about the nasal? Uh, what about the ma uh, mask interface? As we know, uh, we have basically three types of mask interfaces: the full face mask, the nasal mask, and the nasal pillows. So, how would you select which type would be uh, the ideal for your patient? Uh, this is uh, uh, this is the largest uh, clinical uh, or, or the observation. It's an observational study done on this uh, subject. Uh, done in France, uh, they have uh, found out that. Um, nasal interface has uh, has the highest uh, highest uh, uh, it is the best I mean uh, in terms of patients adherence it is it has uh, it was uh, two times better than the full face mask and therefore it is more preferred uh, for the patients so back to my second case uh, now we have diagnosed this patient and started uh, the patient on APAP or auto CPAP uh, with a minimum pressure of 5 and a ma uh, maximum pressure of 20. We have set a pressure range and uh, we review our patient in at three months. A patient reports less snoring now, but he still has daytime somnolence. He still complains of waking up with headaches in the morning. So what would be could be the reason? Can this be a lack of compliance? Well, you can easily sort this out by having a look at the compliance data uh, from the machine. It seems to be satisfactory. So then at this point, we decide to go for the uh, uh, pressure titration report. Uh, in the APAP or the auto titrating machine, the advantage is you can uh, get the pressure titration report of the patient. Uh, so what, uh, this is the trace. Uh, you can uh, the previous uh, you can get the previous night trace like so you can clearly see that uh, the patient has needed very uh, high uh, pressures. Uh, to counteract the apneas, uh, the usually uh, the his pressure, uh, the pressure which was given by the machine was around 15 uh, centimeters of water, which is a relatively higher pressure. So at this point, we suspected uh, whether this patient has uh, uh, an element of hypoventilation or nocturnal hypoventilation. Therefore, we decided uh, to uh, go for a transcutaneous overnight carbon dioxide assessment study. Uh, this is what we call the TOSCA. So while the patient was sleeping with the CPAP machine, uh, we uh, have uh, gone for a TOSCA study or transcutaneous carbon dioxide trace throughout the sleep uh, to measure her uh, overnight carbon dioxide uh, tension. Uh, the lower graph shows the carbon dioxide uh, trace. Uh, you can clearly see that uh, I don't know whether it's a bit uh, it's clear to you uh, so the carbon dioxide tension was uh, well over 7 kilopascal uh, the transcutaneous carbon dioxide which clearly indicates that this patient has nocturnal hypoventilation right so uh, the patient's uh, overnight CO2 trace was over 7 kilopascal indicating significant nocturnal hypoventilation and therefore the patient uh, was switched to the BPAP or the BiPAP mode um, with an EPAP of 10 and an IPAP of 20. Uh, that uh, we, I mean, the, so we have a pressure support of 10 and uh, the patient symptomatically improved. So the learning point here is in severe obstructive sleep apnea may be associated with nocturnal hypoventilation, which may not be addressed by CPAP alone. And these patients uh, treatment has to be escalated from CPAP to BPAP or BiPAP. So uh, the next, uh, uh, my next uh, objective is to uh, have a look at this non-CPAP therapies. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to uh, discuss much about this because we have three eminent speakers uh, who are going to talk about these non-CPAP therapies in a while. Um, mainly the gastric bypass surgery, uh, this mandible advancement spins or devices, uh, this hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Uh, so there are some new evidence coming up on this subject myofunctional therapies, uh, these maxillomandibular osteotomies, and there's some new evidence coming up uh, on carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as well. Uh, a couple of weeks back, the ERS issued a guideline on non-CPAP therapies of OSA. I suggest you go and have a look on that uh, paper as well, because that discussed, that actually gave a guideline on non-CPAP therapies, especially for those who are not willing to go for CPAP. Right. Uh, the last part of my talk would be to have a look at the uh, uh, look at the guidelines and uh, or guidelines devised by different bodies. So we basically have uh, the American guideline or the AASM, American Academy for Sleep Medicine guideline. Uh, so this is uh, I'm not sure whether it's clear. So uh, 
the uh, this guideline basically uh, shows that once you diagnose a patient with obstructive sleep apnea syndrome and uh, if you have to uh, you discuss uh, the, uh, the clinician discuss uh, with the patient uh, of the possible treatment options and if the patient uh, then uh, willing to go for CPAP you assess for comorbidities if the patient has comorbidities uh, you uh, do a pressure titration, have to do a pressure titration and then go for fixed pressure CPAP mode. If the patient has uh, not much comorbidities, you can straight away offer the patient APAP or auto titrating PAP. Uh, this is the UK guideline jointly issued by the BTS, NICE and the RCP. Uh, so uh, basically uh, uh, this guideline uh, they divide uh, in, it is divided into two three groups a mild OSA group uh, without symptoms uh, and uh, the guide uh, what they say is uh, they only need these lifestyle uh, of a lifestyle interventions and uh, mild OSA mild to moderate uh, um, I mean mild OSA syndrome and moderate to severe OSA syndrome need CPAP. The UK guideline has a separate guideline for obesity hypoventilation syndrome as well. And uh, there's uh, the third part is uh, uh, the COPD, uh, obese, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, hypopnea syndrome overlap guideline uh, or the overlap syndrome guideline. So I think uh, you can have a look at these uh, guidelines uh, in the uh, internet. So this is the guideline that I've told you. This was released a couple of weeks back. Uh, the ERS uh, guideline on non-CPAP therapies, which discuss some uh, novel upcoming therapies uh, or non-CPAP therapies for obstructive sleep apnea, especially for patients who were not willing to go for CPAP. So in summary, uh, in obstructive sleep apnea, the group of patients who would most likely benefit uh, from treatment or diagnosis and treatment are the group with symptoms. There is insufficient evidence for screening and treating asymptomatic patients. Still, there aren't enough evidence to support treating OSA with high cardiovascular risk, regardless of their symptoms. With regard to obstructive sleep apnea and cardiovascular risk, observational studies, I mean, non-randomized control trials, have assessed uh, symptomatic patients, while randomized control trials have recruited non-sleepy patients. Hence, there's a difference between the RCTs and non-RCT evidence. CPAP initiation using APAP or autotitrating PAP is preferred over the fixed pressure PAP since the former increases the compliance. Out of the interfaces, nasal interface has the highest evidence for treatment adherence. Patients on CPAP not improving their symptoms should have their pressure titrations checked and subjected to overnight transcutaneous carbon dioxide monitoring to pick, uh, pick up nocturnal hypoventilations and switched over to the BiPAP or the BPAP mode. There are, I mean, there is some upcoming evidence for non-CPAP therapy, especially uh, for those who refuse PAP treatment. So that's uh, it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Damit, for your comprehensive talk on management of sleep-related breathing disorders. Our next speaker is Dr. Kishara Gunaratna. Can I have a slide? Dr. Kishara Gunaratna is a board-certified neurologist with a special interest in epilepsy, he underwent overseas training at the National Hospital of Neurology and Neurosurgery, Queen's Square, London and Oxford University. He works currently as a senior lecturer in medicine and an honorary consultant neurologist at the Department of Medicine and Mental Health Faculty of Medicine, University of Maratua. Over to you, Dr. Kishan. Thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction and I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Sleep Assembly uh, in uh, giving this uh, opportunity to speak to you on neurological uh, sleep disorders and an overview. This is by no means a, a comprehensive lecture. It will touch upon uh, uh, a few uh, of the neurological sleep disorders that we, uh, and the common neurological disorders that uh, one might encounter. So as you know, sleep-related disorders are a group of illnesses with marked effects on patients' quality of life and functional ability as 
the previous speakers have highlighted to you before. Uh, since sleep uh, disorders often uh, remain undiagnosed, the actual prevalence of sleep uh, disorders uh, is generally unknown, but certain studies suggest that the prevalence is uh, between 10 and 15 percent of the general population, but that can, certain studies actually suggest even higher rates of nearly 30 percent or so. Uh, and this is mainly because uh, sleep disorders still uh, remain often undiagnosed. Right, you've seen this classification before. Uh, this is the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. Uh, the, uh, and basically all sleep disorders are categorized into these th uh, six categories, which include insomnia, sleep-related breathing disorders, central disorders of hypersomnolence, uh, circadian uh, rhythm sleep uh, wake, uh, wake up disorders, parasomnias and sleep-related movement disorders, of which you've uh, heard a lot about sleep-related breathing disorders. Um, obviously not going to touch upon that. We will be touching upon uh, the other categories uh, which are which fall under uh, the domain of neurology. So symptoms of sleep disorders generally uh, they are the three cardinal symptoms are either they have inability to fall asleep or sleep through the night. They can have uh, excessive daytime sleepness or daytime hypersomnolence. Uh, or they may have sleep-related movement phenomena. So uh, often uh, the patient will come with uh, one of one or uh, a combination of uh, these cardinal symptoms. So my main uh, my talk will be based on these uh, cardinal symptoms. So lack of sleep, insomnia. Uh, so this is a disorder which uh, involves uh, a, it's a disorder of initiation and or maintaining sleep, uh, and this is uh, generally uh, referred to as, an ins as insomnia. And it's generally classified into uh, primary and secondary. Uh, primary insomnia is where there is no organic cause uh, that we can find. Uh, and generally in primary insomnia, women are most likely to be affected more than men. Um, and uh, uh, it is often, <coughs> uh, it is also more prevalent uh, in uh, in the elderly because of the physiologic, most often, uh, the physiological changes that one might see with uh, the sleep cycle as, as we age. Uh, problems with primary insomnia is that uh, it, it can be a risk factor. Uh, there's more and more, uh, there are more and more studies that support the possibility that uh, uh, these patients are at a higher risk for dementia and also psychiatric comorbidities such as anxiety disorders as well as alcohol dependence. Secondary insomnias uh, can be caused by uh, several medical conditions of which the commonest cause or uh, number one cause for uh, secondary insomnia is actually psychiatric comorbidities. Examples include de depression, anxiety, alcohol dependence. Uh, of course, uh, disorders involving the central nervous system, uh, like uh, any uh, form of neurodegenerative disorder or inflammatory or, uh, disorder, uh, even tumors can uh, then can cause uh, secondary insomnia. Polyneuropathies, especially painful uh, polyneuropathies or uh, small fiber neuropathy, which causes a lot of pain, especially at night, uh, can cause uh, can be a secondary cause for insomnia. RLS or restless leg syndrome, quite common to cause insomnia. Uh, sleep related, so OSA as well, uh, a cause for insomnia. Uh, heart failure, uh, endocrinopathies like thyrotoxicosis, and sometimes external factors such as loud noise, um, uh, shift work, and so on and so forth. So these are the secondary causes for insomnia. Now we go shift on to um, uh, increased sleepiness or daytime hypersomnolence. So this is more of an algorithmic uh, approach that one could have uh, when assessing uh, daytime hypersomnolence. Uh, so if, if, if a patient comes to you with daytime hypersomnolence, you start off by uh, trying to gauge whether uh, the patient's got uh, a sufficient amount of sleep or not. Uh, and if it's no, it is more likely 
that the daytime hype somnolence, like most of us, who um, it's as a result of sleep deprivation. Uh, and that again can be uh, due to, again, insomnia per se, uh, prime, whether it be primary or secondary. If the patient's got enough or sufficient sleep, uh, is the sleep um, refreshing or not? So if the, if the, uh, the sleep is uh, uh, sort of not refreshing, if, if, the, if the patient wakes up uh, saying that, that he's more or less tired, uh, um, yeah, uh, if, if it is not refreshing, then uh, you need to ask whether the patient's got, uh, you know, uh, sleep disturbance during the uh, during the night. So if the if there is a disturbance in sleep, um, uh, then if it's yes, and uh, then the the uh, possibilities are that the patient may be having. Um, um, RLS, periodic limb movement disorder, uh, and other causes um, uh, that can uh, disrupt sleep. Uh, if the patient's having um, refreshing sleep, then uh, you need to um, assess whether um, if uh, the, the possibility to with, with, you need to ask the patient whether he is able to sleep at night. And if the answer is yes. Um, then the most likely uh, the, the most likely cause is uh, central hypersomnolence, of which narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia uh, are, are causes. If no, then it's most likely that you're dealing with a circadian rhythm disorder, such as shift work, advanced phase uh, um, circadian uh, disorder, or a delayed phase uh, circadian circadian disorder. So, um, as you can see. Um, uh, an algorithmic approach to daytime som somnolence might give you an idea as to what kind of uh, disorder you are dealing with. Now, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about narcolepsy, which is again a, 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 an, an idiopathic uh, cause for excessive sleepiness. Uh, so the, the cardinal features of narcolepsy include excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, where there are uncontrolled episodes, episodes of falling asleep during the daytime, and these are called sleep attacks, uh, and or prolonged sleep not explained by other disorders. There are two types, there's type 1 and there's type 2. Type 1 uh, is narcolepsy with uh, a phenomenon called cataplexy. Um, I'll come to cataplexy in a little while, and type 2 is narcolepsy without cataplexy. Um, uh, so the other features are uh, uh, of, especially of type one narcolepsy, is hypnagogic and hypnopompic or uh, hallucinations or vivid hallucinations uh, when you're about to fall asleep or when waking up. Sleep paralysis, so as soon as you wake up, um, the inability to move, which is very frightening. Uh, automatic behaviors uh, during this period uh, of waking up and uh, uh, falling asleep you might have uh, behavioral uh, changes uh, um, which are attributed to falling asleep where the patient is unaware of and of, of course fragmented sleep at night. So these are features that would, we would uh, see with narcolepsy. Uh, so this is a video that of cataplexy. So here's a person actually with the history of narcolepsy and uh, this video is actually going to demonstrate this process of cataplexy that, that uh, uh, these patients frequently have. That's a circumstance where you just kind of like lose muscle tone, you become yeah. uh, uh, even almost paralyzed. So uh, unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. And so let's take a look, look at this. And uh, oftentimes it's um, actually this video clip is someone who is, uh, was, uh, was demonstrating so, like a dance exercise and because of the, the uh, person's background pathology just, just happens to having just capture, happens the to moment. capture this moment huh. right on the videotape. So let's take a, a look at that. So here she is describing like these dance motions, and then uh, we'll we'll see just this abrupt like loss of a, a, a motor tone, and um, because this person has uh, underlying narcolepsy, we'll actually see like the, this person just pro goes out. Poo, that's that's so unfortunate. Deep, deep sleep. So a terrible, actually, circumstance. To That's have. what cat so cataplexy—just that sudden paralysis, and then yeah. all of a sudden you just have. 
So as you can see in the video, it's a, uh, it's a sudden loss of tone, um, uh, often uh, triggered by uh, a strong emu emotional uh, stimulus. Uh, sometimes uh, just laughing at a joke might actually trigger one of these uh, events. And often these are misdiagnosed as um, you know, non-epileptic events or uh, syncope and so on and so forth. But as you can see, there was no loss of consciousness. But uh, in the video, you did uh, uh, see the uh, patient going into uh, sleep very, very quickly, which is called a sleep attack uh, seen with narcolepsy. Of course, uh, all patients uh, with cataplexy don't look like this. Right. Um, so there is uh, type 1 and type 2 type uh, one is often associated with, uh, there, is an, there, is, there is an HLA association. Um, there is this, uh, uh, the uh, proposed mechanism of, of narcolepsy as uh, uh, with, uh, the, the, the suggestion is that it is a autoimmune um, uh, pathology or pathophysiology. Of course, there's, um, uh, there is no um, evidence strong evidence to uh, suggest that. Um, there seems to be a disturbance of the hypercretin or exin system which is uh, required to maintain wakefulness in, in uh, narcolepsy. Uh, and um, especially with type one, where, the, where we uh, observe uh, cataplexy, uh, the CSF hypercretin uh, or, or exin levels are very, very low. Uh, we don't see that uh, too much with uh, the, the type two. Um, and uh, the, uh, the diagnostic tests that we would generally do are MSLTs or multiple sleep lat latency tests, where we, we would uh, um, have a threshold of less than eight minutes to diagnose um, uh, narcolepsy. Of course, uh, with the combination of sleep onset uh, REM. So that's a bit about narcolepsy. Uh, the other uh, disorder that goes, on, goes hand in hand with uh, narcolepsy is idiopathic hypersomnance. Uh, again, excessive daytime sleepiness. Of course, without the REM associated symptoms uh, such as sleep paralysis or cataplexy. These are the diagnostic criteria. Uh, you can have daytime uh, lapses into sleep or it is uh, irrepressible need to sleep on a daily basis. They would sleep for hours and hours and hours. Uh, not uh, sort of even if they wake up, they're confused. They don't know what they're doing, which is called sleep drunkenness. They they don't really uh, even recall what they have done for a few hours sometimes. Um, and they uh, there's an absolute requirement to sleep for hours and hours and hours. Um, there's absence of insufficient uh, sleep syndrome, absence of cataplexy, obviously, which if they, with the presence that would suggest narcolepsy. Uh, absence of other causes of hypersomnia, which is, uh, and often uh, drugs can be a, a cause. Uh, and of course, the presence of a positive MSLD, LT. Uh, they don't have, like in narcolepsy, sleep onset, REM sleep. So we've spoken about um, lack of sleep, more sleep, and now movements in sleep. Um, so, of which parasomnia are the commonest uh, type of sleep disorder that we would generally encounter. Um, and it is a sleep disorder that in involves unusual and undesirable physical events or experiences that disrupt sleep. Um, parasomnia can occur before or during sleep or indeed during arousal from sleep as well. Generally categorized into um, REM sleep associated uh, parasomnias and non-REM sleep associated uh, parasomnias. They can often uh, be mistaken for nocturnal seizures as well. So it is often a, a differential diagnosis that we need to consider, especially uh, when uh, because of the treatment options being completely different. And this is a slide that would generally uh, try to differentiate the two. Uh, especially nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy or uh, seizures um, can uh, mimic uh, non-REM parasomnias and vice versa. Uh, if, if the events are multiple during the night, it's more likely uh, that you're dealing with uh, a, a 
uh, seizures. Um, it, if it uh, occurs during uh, N2, it is more likely that you're dealing with a seizure, whereas we often observe uh, in, uh, in sorry, non REM uh, parasomnias uh, during N3. Um, if it is very stereotypic, short lasting, generally lasting less than one minute, you're most likely dealing with a seizure than a, a parasomnia. So those are the main cardinal features that you'd look for, especially in, you know, on a PSG or a polysomnography when uh, you are assessing for uh, non-REM parasomnias. These are the examples for non-REM parasomnias and uh, REM uh, parasomnias. Uh, the highlighted ones are the commonest. Uh, uh, night terror, sleepwalking, or what we call somnambulance, is often uh, seen in children, young children, and young adults. And we do see the people experiencing these uh, overflowing onto adulthood as well. So, uh, of course, that being the minority, but these are the two most common parasomnias that we would generally see. Of course, we also see sleep uh, related eating disorders, and maybe a, which may be a cause for uh, obesity as well and uh, a known uh, non-REM parasomnia. Confusional arousals, bruxism, menuresis, uh, sleep staring, sleep talking, head banging, all examples of non-REM parasomnias. REM uh, related uh, parasomnia, the quintessential or the stereotypical example is RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder. Um, and of course sleep paralysis which is very very um, frightening for patients who ex actually experience it. A little bit about REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, RBD is characterized by movements during REM sleep. So when you actually assess the polysomnograph, uh, the polysomnogram, um, uh, the uh, mental leads uh, over the, the mentalis, uh, during REM sleep, uh, it's, a, it's a flat line. There, there is no muscle activity. Uh, but if you do uh, observe muscle activity uh, during REM sleep, the most likely diagnosis is that you are dealing with a REM sleep behavior disorder. Uh, you can have very complex movements. They are often vi quite violent. Uh, and uh, in most cases, they, these patients are act actually acting out the vivid dreams that they would generally experience. Uh, and this might often result with uh, injury either uh, to the, the patient, uh, him or herself, or the bed partner. So it's quite uh, uh, violent um, and can cause injury. Um, and it may be uh, a pre precursor to a neurodegenerative disorder. So there is idiopathic um, uh, REM sleep dis behavior disorder. And that's, of course, secondary causes for REM sleep behavior or RBD of which uh, Parkinson's or Parkinson disease uh, is one of the, the uh, main causes for RBD, which is a alpha synuclinopathy. Of course, uh, the other being multi-system atrophy. So you might have RBD preceding these neurodegenerative disorders many years uh, before the actual onset of the neurodegenerative disorder. A little bit of how RBD would look like. Sorry, you need to wait for a little while. You might fall asleep while... Even now you can, if you notice the, the red line, that's uh, EMG activity, which is probably not uh, uh, expected uh, during REM sleep. And you can see the movements now quite. Um,
All right. So this is uh, uh, quite an interesting phenomenon where you see fairly violent movements, especially during sleep, uh, REM sleep, where we wouldn't we would expect complete atonia. All right. Uh, can be often also mistaken for a nocturnal seizure as well. well. Okay, a little bit about uh, restless leg, leg syndrome. Um, these are the clinical criteria. It's generally an un, un, unpleasant sensation. Uh, you can have a little bit of paresthesia. May, uh, you may have pain. You may have uh, uh, the sensation of like uh, animals craw crawling up your legs. It's often associated with your legs. Um, typically occurring during periods of rest. And it's uh, partially or totally relieved by um, by movement, and it is uh, it has a circadian circadian uh, rhythm, where there is uh, worsening uh, towards the evening or at night or close towards uh, bedtime, and can be very disabling and can cause uh, sleep disturbance. And it is often associated with a period periodically movement in sleep. Uh, so often they go hand in hand. Symptoms are uh, often, uh, sorry, they, and the diagnostic criteria also su um, sort of uh, suggest that they not, they're not explained by another condition. There are, there are uh, various associations uh, with RLS. It's often, in the majority of cases, it's idiopathic. Uh, can have a 10% chance of uh, it being familial as well. Yeah can be secondary to iron deficiency. So it's important for you to do a serum ferritin. And if the ferritin is low, you need to basically supplement those patients with uh, iron therapy. Chron chronic kidney disease is, uh, is again a common association. Heart disease, diabetes, Parkinson's disease, a very common uh, co um, complication of um, Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease has a variety of sleep disorders associated with this, uh, of which RLS, RLS is, being, uh, is uh, uh, an, an example. Drugs, again, antipsychotics, SSRIs, uh, 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 steroids, beta adrenergic agonists also can uh, trigger RLS. A little bit about periodic limb movement. Uh, movements in sleep. It's generally characterized by repeated leg jerks or kicks during sleep, often associated with the lower limbs, but can be associated with uh, the upper limbs as well. Um, and generally you see uh, these uh, movements repetitively over, over the uh, course of uh, sleep. It is often seen in, in uh, non-REM sleep. Um, and generally require, uh, we require generally an, uh, a fixed number of, of uh, movements to um, sort of diagnose it. We, a minimum of around 15 kicks or uh, abrupt movements of the lower limbs uh, is, an is an requirement for the, for the diagnosis. Uh, just to show what it looks like, it's often associated, as I said to you before, uh, with uh, restless leg syndrome. So the brief flexing uh, of, of the leg, if you observed uh, those movements, and these would occur repetitively over, over, over non-REM sleep and often causing fragmentation of sleep and frequent arousal. Sometimes the patient is aware. In most cases, the patient is unaware. And it's actually, uh, uh, you need to basically inquire from the bed partner uh, whether these movements are present or not. And that can cause daytime hypersomnolence. Uh, the last few slides, uh, this is on circadian uh, rhythm sleep disorders. Uh, and it's a group of disorders which are, uh, so it's a, uh, it's um, uh, very simply put, it's uh, uh, desynchronized or your body clock or your circadian rhythm within uh, is not in sync with the day, uh, the night day uh, cycle, uh, which is an external um, uh, factor. So it's not, it is in, not in sync. Um, and that's what it means, right? 
Um, and it, um, these are the examples of uh, circadian rhythm sleep disorders, delayed sleep phase, advanced sleep phase disorder, non-24 hour sleep wake disorders, irregular sleep wake uh, rhythm disorder, jet lag and shift work sleep disorder. These are the examples that we would have and just to make you understand what it means. So this is normal sleep where one would um, uh, sleep at a reasonable hour of uh, uh, between 8 and 12 uh, a.m. and then uh, wake up before 8 a.m. Fairly long uh, sleeping hours, not so much uh, the sleep that I would have, but uh, half of us are sleep deprived anyway. Right, so, um, so if it's advanced sleep phase, then um, uh, it's uh, where this, the patient or, or, or the said person would sleep uh, far earlier and wake up um, far earlier. So that's what it means, advanced sleep phase. Uh, often seen with the elderly, um, it's very common. Uh, where they sleep much earlier and wake up very, very early. Um, and of course, then we see the delayed sleep phase where they sleep much later and wake up much, much later. Uh, and often seen with adolescents, apparently, uh, because they are partying all the time. I uh, hope we can do that as well. <laughs> right. So um, the uh, irregular sleep wakes uh, rhythm is where you, there are these short naps right throughout the day. Um, where there is frequent uh, sleeping and awakening. Um, so just um, often these are um, uh, brought on by our own lifestyle and even shift work is the same where uh, we should be uh, uh, sleeping when we should be awake and people are awake when they should be sleeping. So uh, these are the circadian rhythm uh, disorders and this comes to the end of my brief overview of neurological disorders. So in conclusion, sleep disorders in neurology are he very heterogeneous or heterogeneous. It's a heterogeneous group of disorders with diverse manifestations, as you can see. Uh, their proper diagnosis can prevent uh, secondary diseases because there is uh, quite a lot of secondary diseases that are associated with these disorders uh, and uh, prevent the worsening of concomitant conditions. So I thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Keshara, for that informative and inter interesting lecture. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Teshan Vijayaratna, who will be talking to us about outcomes of bariatric surgery in sleep-related breathing disorders. Uh, Professor Teshan uh, Vijayaratna is a consultant surgeon and professor in surgery at the Department of Surgery, University of Sri Jayavadanapura. And he's a board certified general surgeon with special interest in laparoscopic upper gastrointestinal and pancreatic biliary surgery. He has been trained in Australia in bariatric and metabolic surgery and has been in practicing the same for the last 11 years. Over to you, Professor Techana. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And thank you very much for the President and the Council of the uh, Respiratory Physicians for giving me this opportunity uh, to be here. <coughs> And uh, of course, uh, a word about uh, Dr. Amita Fernando. I can't see him here. 12 years ago, when we started these operations um, with very obese patients, uh, there only very few people were there to help us, especially in the respiratory field, because anesthetizing these people were a nightmare. And Amita Fernando did a marvelous job in, uh, in actually uh, 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 initiating CPAP therapy and assessing these patients and making them safe for surgery. And he has trained a lot of young, enthusiastic respiratory physicians who work with us, um, and uh, like Chandimani and so on and so forth. Um, but it was that uh, single-handed effort of Amita Fernando, um, which has made all this possible for us to kind of cure most of these pe people who otherwise would have died with uh, severe obesity hyperventilation syndrome. So <clears throat> with that, I would uh, start talking about outcomes of bariatric surgery in sleep-related breathing disorders. And I'm not an expert in the respiratory cycle. I'm a real, quite an amateur here. But I would tell you what I see as a surgeon in this uh, particular field. Sleep-related breathing disorders are very common among obese. We have heard it over and over again. Uh, by the several speakers who have already spoken. Uh, as Amita in his talk mentioned, the, the 
jo- the, the joy, the fat boy in the pick pick in uh, the, the pick pick book, uh, the yeah, pick pick books in uh, the, uh, the so in the um, uh, uh, so called uh, the <clears throat> the sorry. Um, yeah in the in the in the uh, charles dickens uh, uh, book um so um yeah so out of uh, um, i mean uh, i think uh, from there uh, we have uh, started naming this syndrome as pickwickian syndrome so obviously hyperventilation syndrome ohs is the main disorder affecting the obese and also the <clears throat> sleep in obese patients and it's a complex interaction between sleep distorted breathing diminished respiratory drive and obesity as well as respiratory dysfunction so to uh, diagnose obesity hyperventilation syndrome in the classic scenario your body mass index has to be more than 30 equal or more than 30 and awake hypercapnia of paco2 more than 45 now but there are several new definitions for this i will not go into details of that this uh, because there is this subgroup where where they are they have the symptoms but the arterial paco2 at daytime are not reaching 45 but they are a kind of intermediary group who will eventually end up in the ohs category <clears throat> of course other causes of awake hyperventilation such as lung or neuromuscular disorders have to be excluded what's the problem with ohs why are we worried about this you see the mortality is 23% within 1.5 years after diagnosis if not treated effectively so this disease is a killer about 194 patients will roughly die Uh, within 1.5 years, that is 18 months of follow-up. This is a very important paper that has been published on this subject, where they have followed up these patients as to what happens. So that's why this disease has to be addressed. How common it is it? It will be seen in about 10 to 20 percent of patients presenting to respiratory or sleep clinics. I mean, you all will be seeing this in the in the range of about one in six to one in five. Quite common. in your uh, clinic practice and over 50% of the super obese now that is bmi over 50 who get hospitalized will have this syndrome then a um, lot of uh, our speakers have been speaking on data from what has been happening abroad but i'll be talking on data from sri lanka um, so in sri lanka the prevalence of obesity we know is about 14% pretty high for a south asian country um, and analyzing our data over the past 12 years the mean bmi of the patients undergoing bariatric surgery at and i my care was 44.7 that is about 45 so you can see once again for a asian uh, bariatric surgical practice this is a pretty high figure and you can imagine the number of obesity hyperventilation syndrome patients who would be among these people why does obese get it what is the problem how how do they who, how, what are the postulated mechanism there are obesity related changes in the respiratory system i will not go into details of that the there are alterations in the respiratory drive that's a central problem and there are breathing abnormalities during sleep which are more commonly or exclusively seen in obese people which are not seen in normal people as you know you all have been talking about the neck circumference or increased waist to hip ratio associated with the neck circumference increased neck circumference is due to excess fat deposition and this compress the upper airway this upper airway collapse especially in the in the sleep in supine position is a is a big problem and the in ineffective ventilation the excessive fat deposition around the in the mediastinum as well as around the lungs the chest wall itself produces ineffective um, uh, ventilatory efforts and the visceral fat which in supine position pushes the diaphragm up which makes the lower zonal ventilation a problem and these people have a end end their end respiratory uh, expiratory volume is high and there is carbon dioxide retention and and uh, alveolar air retention in the lung bases in these people and uh, amita has also been speaking about leptin now leptin levels actually talking about in the obese um, many studies show that the leptin levels are actually high in the obese so in 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 that uh, uh, in in 
in if you apply the real leptin therapy they they should be eating less but it doesn't happen that way because in the obese there is this unknown mechanism where the central leptin um, sensitivity is absolutely very very low so the the this central leptin deficiency or the insensitivity is the thing which will keep on all the leptin levels are high leptin does not act on the 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 your hunger centers so that is the problem in these people so on and so forth there are so many other hormones which act centrally in the obese to drive their obesity and to reduce the effect of or the effective breathing in the night <clears throat> so what are the management options we have all heard about pap therapy there is a component of non invasive ventilation and of course some of these patients have underlying asthma and other sleep Uh, issues i'm uh, sorry other respiratory issues which need to be treated before we get on with the pap therapy and the, and so on and so forth but the problem is in the obesity hyperventilation syndrome the obesity is the underlying cause of the disease so uh, effective weight management therapy is essential because without that whatever the other uh, treatments that are been done will long term be ineffective so it's been uh, clearly proven today the bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment option in long term management of obesity hyperventilation syndrome and this of course there was a lot of fear a big fear about getting these patients to operation beds because everybody knew that this can be cured or that this can be virtually treated very well by bariatric surgery but the risk of an obese obesity hyperventilation syndrome patient undergoing bariatric surgery has been the key issue in physicians and patients uh, getting these operations done but but we know today that the higher risk surgical risk in an obese patient with ohs in underlying surgery can be effectively treated in pre op cpap therapy and this is what we have been doing over the past few years and we have been the you guys the respiratory physicians have been doing a lot of work in making these people absolutely safe for our anesthetists to anesthetize and for us to go ahead safely with the surgery and of course we together see the beautiful outcomes of these operations later on so a little bit about the management of obesity uh, this you see uh, just like lot of obesity related illnesses ohs is also um, kind of affects the asians much earlier or much severely than the westerners so because of that the new asia pacific guidelines in in management of obesity have reduced the interventional guide, interventional parameters in bmi so um, some of you may not be aware of this that's why i put up this slide so in the traditionally we say overweight is bmi 25 to 29 in asia pacific is over 23 uh, and there is this at risk category 23 to 20, 25 that is asia, asia pacific guideline class 1 obesity is 30 to 30, 30 to 39 kind of 35 in the the standard classification but for us it's 25 to 30 so so 35 to 40 we have the class 2 but for us it's over 30 and over 37.5 is morbidly obese or class 3 obese so this discrepancy is brought about by because of not only because of ohs but because of uh, the cardiovascular risk factors the risk, the the endocrine risk factors like uncontrolled diabetes and so on and early deaths are more common in the obese asians than in the obese westerners so that's why these figures have been uh, kind of changed so when you manage these patients with ob obesity hyperventilation syndrome you can do your sleep studies do everything get them on cpap but you cannot stop there now that is the most important message that i have to give you because the problem is not going to solve there if the patient is class 3 obese there is less than 5% chance of that patient responding to any other treatment of management of obesity other than bariatric surgery i am not saying this these are proven well proven uh, kind of uh, facts so because the weight will continue to increase the bmi will continue to increase you will continue to adjust your cpap to bipap to and various other modalities but the obesity will continue to increase and in the end it will be ineffective and 
sleep and OHS is not the only thing which is going to kill the patient as well. It's the, the cardiovascular problems, the other endocrine problems and so on and so forth. So you fail in your duty if you don't do something effective for these patients, especially who are in class 3. Class 1 and class 2, it's diet and medication. Right. So when the patients come to us, what do we do? We assess them and we get on with bariatric surgery. So what are these bariatric surgeries? Now, just to give a little overview, it's a, it's a, it's a change that we do to the upper gastrointestinal tract, which will in turn make the patient, one thing, lose their desire to eat more or hyperphagia and then um, will lead to in reduce intake of calories and in turn will lose weight in a, in a natural and a permanent way. So there are several options that are available. We do the, the one, first one is the sleeve gastrectomy, the commonest bariatric operation in the world. 50% of, of bariatric operations are these operations, but in my practice it's only about 25% because 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 of a different reason now we in that we take the sac like stomach we convert it to a tube like stomach now everything else after that are bypasses these are the two common bypasses the ruan my gastric bypass the as when you call gastric bypass that is the by, bypass we are talking about the gold standard bariatric operation where we create about a 20 cc gastric pouch at the top end and then cause uh, and then and, as, and bypass about proximal one third of the, the small intestine to achieve a malabsorption. Then a mini gastric bypass when this operation is done with a, a single anastomosis at, at, which is actually my, my most favorite bariatric operation. So how do they work apart from this calorie intake? It's about, it's by changing the, the, the neurochemical or the neurohormonal uh, milieu within the uh, about in the gut, which in effect affect the, the, your centers in the brain. So one of the key things that change is ghrelin. Ghrelin reduction, ev wherever we exclude the gastric fundus, if you, in all bariatric operations, we prevent food coming and touching the gastric fundus. Gastric fundus has the highest number of ghrelin receptors in the body. And this ghrelin drive, as Amita said, is the one which drives your hyperphagia, the desire to eat more and more and more. So the ghrelin take is taken out. Then we increase the, the after bypasses, especially the GLP-1 levels and PYY levels goes very high. And the GLP-1 levels uh, in turn kind of drastically start reducing the the the, all the absorptive mechanisms in the proximal small intestine, especially control the diabetes, which is, which is a weight uh, loss independent uh, achievement of the gastric bypass operations. So there are so many, I mean, I can go on talking about that, but, but there's, I mean, there's no time for that. But these neurohormonal or neurochemical changes of bariatric surgery are the ones which gives um, the biggest central effect on the obesity hyperventilation syndrome patients as well. You know, the daytime wakefulness and the sensitivity of the carbon dioxide, the hypercapnia to make this patient breathe properly is a, it's a now well proven thing that it's a central mechanism that is brought about by the, the hormonal changes that happen after bariatric surgery. So taking a few examples of our own patients, 30-year-old male, uh, BMI 48, or obstructive sleep apnea on, I mean, he was, he was obstructive sleep apnea for years when he came to us, uncontrolled hypertension. Now you see, can see the amount of central obesity. And this is within 48 hours, we discharge these patients. Those are the only cuts that they get on their stomach. And this patient got admitted uh, one year later for a different, I mean, in the ENT issue. And you can see the complete different uh, just look at his neck and you can understand how his obstructive sleep apnea or the obesity hyperinflation has completely disappeared. So, and uh, this is uh, perhaps one of the youngest pe children, people that we have operated in Sri Lanka uh, for obesity hyperinflation syndrome, um, managed by the respiratory physician of Gaul. I mean, they have done so much for this patient. Um, in uh, dependent on uh, CPAP for sleeping, but the daytime hypercapnia was very severe in this patient. The patient 
could not move or could not uh, work without a ambulatory oxygen device that little bag is ambulatory oxygen device and even just before surgery you can see she came to the theater with the ambulatory oxygen device you know planted in her nose um, so uh, after bariatric surgery all it took was five months to take the CPAP machine off and of course she has missed school a lot I mean oh, normal development was not there in this child she's schooling today and uh, she had a lot of other medical conditions they also resolved by one year